Hey, welcome to church. I am so glad that you chose to join us. You know, Jesus thought very clearly that coming together as a church was really important for our spiritual life and development. And I know it may be a little weird the way it is, but can I tell you something? What you're doing right now, it counts. In heaven's scheme of things, it counts. We are coming together. We rely on the Spirit of God so that when we worship together, even though we're separated by blocks or miles, we're worshiping together. When there's an invitation given and somebody in their home prays a prayer of salvation, text help, you know what? There are thousands of us around the world that are praying for you as you do that. So what you're doing right now really blesses God. And although it may be a little unusual, it counts. We are coming together to worship Him and to have church. And it's gonna be a great time together. We're gonna to worship God in song as we oftentimes do. And then we're gonna hear a word that's gonna enrich us. And during the word, we're gonna take communion. So I encourage you, whatever way you need to, get some bread, get some juice. It all counts, it's all good. We're gonna to come to the Lord in a variety of different ways. And we can have an expectation that when we come together as we are by His Spirit to Him, He's gonna meet us at our point of need for many of you, this is the time when you give, which is another form of worship to God. Again, I am so grateful for your faithfulness to God, for your generosity to God, for your gratitude to God as you give. The easiest way to give is simply to text Cottonwood to 77977. If you text Cottonwood to 77977, it's a very easy process by which you can make an offering to God. Remember, everything we do over these next few minutes counts as a worship to God. Let's honor God, let's bless Him, and in turn, let's have an expectation that He's gonna speak to us. Let's worship the Lord. Hey church, we're gonna take this time and lift up the name of our King Jesus. We're gonna declare that He is good and He is worthy of our praise. We worship you right now, Lord. In the darkness, Without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory.
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, we worship you.
Hey, welcome. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And uh, if you got a Bible, go ahead and pull it out. We're going to use it. Find me the book of Mark, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 2. And uh, this month, uh, the month of August, we're going to begin to wrap up this series we've been in called Jesus in Action. And for the past eight weeks, uh, we've been studying through the book of Mark, and we've been hitting on different topics. And the first month, we, we talked about the miracles of Jesus, uh, specifically here in the book of Mark. And then as we went into the following month, the month of July, we, we talked about the message of Jesus. And now as we step into a new month, month number three, we're going to be talking about the mission of Jesus. We're going to talk about his purpose and his mission in coming to the earth. And we'll be looking at what Jesus said, specifically his mission and his purpose was. And uh, over the next few weeks, we're also going to touch on uh, the Last Supper. We're going to talk about the cross. And we're going to talk about the resurrection. So I'm really excited uh, for this third and this final month of our series, Jesus in Action. Uh, but today, I feel like my job is to sort of set the groundwork that's going to point us in the right direction for the rest of the month as we begin to examine the purpose and the mission of Jesus. Um, Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse number 13. Mark 2, beginning in verse number 13, says this, Then he, speaking of Jesus, he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them, which was his custom. I love that. You see Jesus anytime he's surrounded by a group of people. He's always teaching. He's always giving them insight as to who he is and what the kingdom of God is all about. So the multitude came to him, and he taught them. Verse 14, and he passed by, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to Levi, follow me. So he rose and he followed him. Now it happened as he was dining at Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to Jesus' his disciples, how is it that he eats and he drinks with tax collectors and sinners? Verse 17, when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a, of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Just keep your, your place here in, in Mark chapter 2. We're going to be coming back and making reference to it. But before we dive in, let, let's pray and let's ask the Holy Spirit uh, to bring some illumination and to bring revelation. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you would revive us according to your word. As we open your word, we, we pray that you would illuminate it before us. May your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Holy Spirit, we need you to illuminate your word because we are incapable of seeing your message without your help. So give us understanding, we pray. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. Give us a heart and a mind to comprehend exactly what it is that you're saying. And above all, may you illuminate Jesus. May he become first and foremost in our life. And may he receive all the honor and all the glory forever. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, I, I recently read a story uh, about a small grocery store in England. And uh, uh, as you begin to read this story, you find out that the owner w was quite an interesting fellow, uh, even strange uh, in, in some regards. He, he was very particular about the type of people he would allow into his store. And, and more specifically, he became very particular uh, about different people and the manners that they expressed as they came into the store. For example, uh, if you came into his store and, and you used improper language or you cursed, uh, he would ban you uh, from coming into his store again. Uh, or if you came into the store, maybe you had a, a pet on a leash, um, he would ban you. <laughs> from coming into the store, which wouldn't work so well if it was in California, because here in California, we push our dogs around in baby strollers, which is weird enough in and of itself. But in England, if you came into the store with a pet, uh, he would ban you uh, from his store. Even if you were a parent and you were pushing a baby in a baby stroller, he didn't like the baby strollers in his store, so he would ban you from coming into his store. This was the weirdest scenario I had ever read about. And eventually, this owner got so fed up with the different people coming into his store and their different expressions and their different attitudes that, that he actually ended up banning everyone from having entry to his store. Uh, if you wanted to uh, access the products in his store, what you had to do as a shopper, you had to look through the window and you had to spy out the different items that you wanted to buy and then you would ring a bell 
And then someone that worked for the store would, would come to this little hatch in the door and you'd have to point out what you wanted. They would go and get it and you'd pay for it, but you were never allowed to enter the store. Now, mind you, this whole story, this all took place pre-COVID. Um, so it would have been just the strangest thing in the world. It would have seemed completely unreasonable. And, and the owner was actually asked about his policy for not allowing anyone in the store. And this is what he said, and I quote, he said, I've lost business but I can't say how much. I'm a man of principles and I stand by my decision. Now, we hear a story like that, and at least for me, uh, it would seem like a grocery store owner that bans customers from their store has lost sight of their purpose. I mean, if your mission is to sell groceries, then the truth is you're probably gonna to have to put up with some different types of people that you dislike or that you don't agree with in order to achieve your mission. And in just the same way, just like the grocer, I feel like sometimes for us as believers, we forget our Savior's mission and purpose. You know, in the verses that we've just read, Jesus actually clearly states his mission and his purpose for coming to the earth. He said this, I'm a physician and only the sick need a physician. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I've come for sinners. We're gonna dive a little deeper into that in just, just a moment, but we see Jesus clearly stating his purpose for coming to the earth. And we also see Jesus throughout the other gospels in Matthew, in Luke and John, state his purpose for coming as well. And he says the same thing, he just uses different language. For example, in the book of Matthew, and even we see it again later in the book of Mark, Jesus says it like this, his purpose, his mission. He said, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. In the book of Luke, Jesus talks about his mission, his purpose in terms like this. He says, I've come to seek and I've come to save that which is lost. In the Gospel of John, Jesus uses an illustration. He uses the allegory of him being a door. And he says it like this, I am the door and if anyone enters by me, they will be saved. So if we were to boil it all down, if we were to encapsulate the purpose and the mission of Jesus, I would say it like this, Jesus came to this earth to rescue humanity. Humanity that had, because of sin, become separated from his creator. Jesus came to rescue and to redeem humanity from the slavery and from the bondage of sin. And hear me, Christian, we must never forget that. But the truth is, sometimes we do. We do forget that and instead of acting like our savior and taking on his mission, we act at times kind of like that grocer where we don't like the sinful habits and the worldly ways of the lost or the outsider. We, we don't like the personal requirements and, and the toll that it takes on us to be involved in the lives of the lost or involved in the lives of the outsider. So, so we even sometimes subconsciously create our own lists and our own rules of engagement. Or we go, as long as non-Christians wanna to come to us, we don't have to go to them, but as long as they wanna to come to us and they wanna to come to us on our terms, then, then we're happy to serve. But if not, let them shop somewhere else because of course we've got our principles that we need to maintain. Listen, Jesus always lived with his purpose and his mission in view. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, which mean little Christs, as followers of Jesus, his purpose, it has to become our purpose to seek and to save the lost. Take a moment and think about that phrase. His purpose becomes our purpose. Oftentimes we separate me knowing God and me serving God. And I think what we're discovering through this word is we discover Jesus and more of Jesus oftentimes by joining Jesus in what he's doing. So I have a question for you, a question in response to the word we have heard so far. Who might God be asking you to have a meal with? Who does God want you to sit down with and show his love and his grace for? I'm gonna pray for you just in this minute and then we're gonna go right back into the word at the end of the prayer. But I'm gonna pray that even right now, through the screen by which you are watching and listening to me, the Holy Spirit's gonna impress upon you in your heart, in your mind, a name of somebody that you're gonna invite into a meal and you're gonna discover Jesus 
by joining Jesus in reaching that individual. Let me pray for you. Lord, we are so grateful that you choose to have a meal with us, that you choose to be with us, and we want to know you so much more, Lord Jesus. But we don't want to just restrict it to ourselves. So right now, I pray for each and every one of us watching and listening. Holy Spirit, would you put on our heart, in our mind, the name of an individual you are calling us to, that we would discover you as we join you in your purpose. Put that name, put that mind, sear it into our heart that we know it is from you, it is from heaven. And this week, may we reach out to them. And as we show them your love and grace, may we discover more of your love and grace for ourselves. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Let's go back into the word now. Hey, let's go back uh, to our text just for a moment. Uh, for me, the last verse, uh, the last sentence of verse 17, it perfectly sums up the mission of Jesus. I, I love what it says this. Jesus says, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I came to call them to repentance. I love that. I love that. And that's the first thing that we need to recognize about the purpose and the mission of Jesus. He came to rescue sinners. Now, this statement of Jesus actually gains even more credibility when we tag it on to the fact that he literally just called Levi the tax collector to come up from his tax office, from his desk, and to follow him. And by the way, Levi the tax collector would later be known as Matthew, who would go on to write the Gospel of Matthew. But he was a tax collector, and I'm sure you're already aware of this, but in the first century, um, tax collectors were not the most popular of people. Uh, to equate them today with IRS agents is not even comparable, right? Like it's not even, even similar. Let, let me put it this way. To describe a tax collector in the first century uh, would be like if you were to take a, a, a poll and create a list uh, of public enemy number one. The, the, the consensus answer <laughs> would be tax collectors. They were public enemy number one. They're going to win that poll every single time. The, there are these people that make an extravagant living, extravagant fortune, but they do it by working for the bad guys. Uh, which in this case was the invading, occupying force of, of the Romans. So tax collectors were working for the Romans, but they make their extravagant fortunes by cheating and by exploiting their own countrymen. So by everyone's standards, the tax collector was a sinner of the lowest regard. Now on the other hand, you've got Jesus, who is viewed by society of the day as a religious teacher and he's viewed as the one that's supposed to uphold the highest example of ethics and morality. And yet we see Jesus surrounding himself with tax collectors. It's recorded throughout the Gospels that Jesus spent time with tax collectors. He became the friend of tax collectors. In the book of Matthew, which again, Levi is the one that wrote that, he's recorded as being a friend of sinners. Jesus, the friend of of sinners. So I want you to see this whole picture here. Let's zoom out for a second. 30,000 foot view. We just read here in Mark chapter 2 that Jesus and his disciples are at Levi's house and they're having dinner. They're sharing a meal together. And I love the detail that Mark puts into this story because it's not just Jesus. It's not just Jesus and the disciples. It's not just Jesus, the disciples, and Levi. But Mark actually puts in there that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. They sat there and they shared a meal together. And in Jewish culture, this is a big deal. Sharing a meal together is not just sharing a meal. It's not just a, a cordial kind of one-off get-together or one-off party. No, in Jewish culture, the table, it, it's, it's sacred stuff. It's a sacred space. Um, that's where you did life together. It's where you shared life stories. It was literally the act of sharing life with somebody. It, it, it's the act of ultimate acceptance to sit down at the table and to share a meal. It's as if you're saying to the other person, you're not just my friend, you're not just an acquaintance, you're actually family. So Jesus is sharing life, doing life 
with sinners and with tax collectors. Mark records that the Pharisees and the religious rulers of the day, they see Jesus partaking in the sacred act of sharing a meal and sharing a life together with sinners. And in verse 16, they begin to complain about it. They go, Jesus, how can you hang out? And how can you make nice with these types of people, with, with sinners? You're supposed to be above that. You're supposed to be better than that. And I love Jesus' response to it. In verse 17, he says, I didn't come to call the righteous, I came to call sinners to repentance. You see, his mission, his purpose in coming to earth was always in view. Jesus said, I came for people that can't save themselves. Better yet, uh, and, and perhaps better translated, Jesus says, like, I came for people who have come to the realization that they can't save themselves. That's why he makes the comment about being a physician and that only sick people need a physician, not those that are well. And, and, and if you're like me, kind of in our Western mind, in today's eyes, we, we read that and we kind of go like, oh, oh Jesus, hold on. Um, are, are you saying that the Pharisees are, are righteous? Are you inferring that, that they're well and that they don't need saving? Right, like we, we read that and we begin to think that. And at least on the surface, that's what it looks like. But no, actually, as you dive deeper, you realize that's not what Jesus is saying at all. The answer to what Jesus is saying is found in his assessment of himself being a physician. Let me explain. Um, most people, um, they go to the doctor when they have a health problem that they can't figure out or deal with on their own. Right, that's most people. However, there are other people um, that think their ailment is just a temporary inconvenience. So they're convinced that although their ailment may be significant, uh, they can handle it, they can deal with it, and they can kind of heal themselves. So they refuse to go to the doctor. And we probably all know people that are like that. So when Jesus is referencing the Pharisees as righteous, what he's doing is he's putting them in the same boat spiritually as those people in the natural who won't go to the doctor when they're sick. According to Jesus, self-righteous people think that they can fix themselves, think that they can heal themselves or make themselves right with God through their merits, through their works, and through their, their morality or by being good. And, and here's the revelation. This is what Jesus is wanting us to see. He's teaching that his mission and his purpose is to rescue sinners, those that know that both morally and spiritually they can't save themselves. Hear me, Jesus came for the outcast. Jesus came and he comes for the tax collector. Jesus comes for those of us that are caught up in squalid choices, those of us that are living failed dreams. Jesus comes for corporate executives. He comes for street people. He comes for superstars. He comes for Wall Street investors. He comes for addicts. He comes for IRS agents. He comes for AIDS patients. Jesus even comes for lawyers and for used car salesmen. And in coming for them, in coming for us, Jesus not only talks to us or talks to them, but he actually invites us into a new way of being. He invites us to come and to dine with him and to have a relationship with him. And he does this knowing full well that fellowship with sinners, it's gonna raise the eyebrows of the religious elite and the self-righteous. But again, for Jesus, his mission and his purpose was always in view. He came to rescue sinners. He came to rescue people like you and me. They realize we cannot fix ourselves, that there is something deeply wrong. There is something deeply missing on the inside of us and no amount of doing anything will fix it or fill it. Jesus came to save sinners. The fact is, the more we study the gospel of the grace of God, we'll always see that the gospel turns its face towards sin. I love this, not away from sin, but it turns its face towards sin. The same way that a physician will turn his or her face toward a disease. The same way that a, a nonprofit charity organization will turn its face and look towards distress. And I love our story. Jesus turns his face, he turns his attention toward Levi the sinner, and he invites him to follow. And in the same way Jesus and his gospel, they turn to us. They see us in similar situations and they invite us to follow. He gives us an invitation. 
an invitation for salvation. And this invitation is offered to anyone that's burdened with sin, anybody that is laboring to escape and evade the consequences of that sin. I love it, the gospel, Jesus, he invites everyone and anyone because every person needs this gospel. The gospel of Jesus, it invites the wicked to forsake his way. It, it invites the unrighteous to forsake his thoughts. It, it invites the needy and the thirsty. It invites the, the poor and the naked because each of these states of being are produced by sin. You see the impact of Jesus, it says, look, anyone that is burdened by sin, anyone that is heavy laden, come to me. I will give you rest. He's the only one that can provide exactly what it is our soul is longing for. The invite of Jesus says, look, come to me, anyone who is thirsty, anybody that has dug dry wells and been left wanting more. Jesus says, come to me, I will satisfy the longing of your heart. And Jesus, he would also have us know that his invitation, it comes with a gift. Man, the gracious nature of our Savior. Not only does he invite us to follow him, but he wants to give us a gift. And here's the gift. The gift of God is eternal life. It's forgiveness in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The invitation of the gospel, it comes with this gift. But this gift, you have to understand this. It can't be earned. It can't be merited. It can't be worked for. No. The gospel and its gift, the mission of Jesus, is life for those that are dead in sin and trespasses. It's sight for those that are spiritually blind. It's liberty for the captives. It's cleansing for the filthy. It's grace and it's righteousness for the undeserving. And that gift, that invitation, it's extended to you and me. These are the gifts of the gospel. They cannot be merited. They are not the reward for the self-righteous. They are not the reward for those that try really, really hard and think that they can do it on their own. No, the gift of the gospel is for those who by the power and by the revelation of the Holy Spirit have come to the conclusion that they are sinners and cannot save themselves. And this gospel, the message and the purpose of Jesus, it invites us and it calls us personally to be in relationship with him. Just as Jesus personally and individually saw Levi sitting there at the tax office, just as Jesus picked him out of the crowd, he sees you right where you're sitting, right in the middle of whatever your life looks like right now. He sees you and he comes to you individually. He comes to you specifically. And he offers the same invitation. He offers the same call. He says, follow me. Come and follow me and I'll show you a new way to live. Now, before we close, I got one more thought that I wanna, I wanna share with you. But right now, I'm gonna invite our, our host to come back on the screen and lead us in a time of reflection as we think about the mission, as we think about the purpose of Jesus, that he came to rescue sinners. And we're actually gonna partake in communion together as well. So I'm gonna invite the host to come now and then I'm gonna share one final thought when we partake in communion together. We're gonna take a moment and take communion together. It's an important act that we do in obedience to Jesus. It goes all the way back 2,000 years when Jesus was in the upper room and he made a statement to his disciples about the bread and uh, about the cup, about his body and about his blood. And the thing that he said to them, which is kind of difficult at times to understand and yet it's glorious, he said, listen, this is what I'm doing for you. Communion has a lot of different angles to it. But we felt like on this weekend, what we wanted to focus on was that because of the gift of Christ, we don't have to make things happen in our spiritual life. If anything, communion is a way of recognizing our inability to save ourselves. Jesus broke the bread as a picture of his body forever being given for us that we would have eternal bodies, that we would live in life forever with him in a material way, in a glorious way. That's the promise that gets reinvigorated through communion. And then the blood represented by the cup which is life again, eternal, that's given to us. And as you read through the scriptures, you discover that there are so many parts to this communion. There is healing. And if you're watching and your body is physically broken somehow, 
You can have a faith for healing that comes as you celebrate the work of Christ and his covenant. There is eternal life that comes through communion. There is forgiveness. If you've made some bad choices, if your life hasn't really glorified God, you don't have to live there. You can live with a, an incredible delight and joy of knowing his promise and his love for you. And we're going to take communion together and I'm going to pray and then we'll take communion. But if that's you and you said, wow, I, I really want to walk in the fullness of life forever with Jesus. I want to know that I'm saved, that I'm redeemed, that his righteousness is in me and that my sins are forgiven. Before we take communion, right now while you're watching me, would you do one thing, even before I pray, as a statement of faith, as a declaration to God, text the word HOPE to 411247. Do it right now. It's a way you are saying, God, I am crossing that line. My life belongs to you because I'm about to receive your life and all that you have for me through this act of communion, my faith in you. Text the word HOPE to 411247 as we prepare to take communion. Let me pray, and then we're going to take communion. And I want you to do that kind of in your own intimacy, you, the Spirit of God, leading you in taking the bread and in taking the cup. Lord, we can't find words that accurately describe our gratitude, even our understanding of what it means that you would go to the cross for us. Jesus, we know that you had everything and created everything before your suffering except for us. And yet you were willing to take on the burdens of the sin of the world for me and for each of us. So as we take communion right now, Lord, we do it with a humility, with a joy that is deeper than we can even imagine. We do it with a faith. We trust who you are. We trust what you did. We trust what you say. We take the bread, we take the cup, and we do it with such a gratitude, Lord Jesus, for your death and your resurrection so that we will live forever, fully and gloriously with you. We pray this in your almighty name. Amen. Just take a moment now. Take the bread with me. Think of the work of Christ on the cross for you. Take a moment, take the cup, whatever it is, it's okay. It's a symbol of his blood that was shed for you. Think of this. When Jesus was hanging on the cross and blood was pouring out of his body, he had you on his mind. You were the one he was thinking of. And he was thinking of you with an enormous love, an enormous hope and an enormous grace for all that he has for you. As you take this cup, let it be a cup of joy, a cup of celebration of his goodness and his love for you. Communion is a wonderful thing that we do together. Let's go back into the Word now and let's have this sense of faith that God's going to reveal himself to us as we listen to his Word being taught to us. One final thought uh, before we wrap this up. Last thing I want us to consider is this, that as we consider the mission and the purpose of Jesus, we also must consider that if we're followers of Jesus, his purpose and his mission must now also become our purpose and our mission. So if Jesus' purpose in coming to the earth was rescuing the lost, then our purpose and our mission also needs to be the rescuing of the lost. And just to be clear, uh, we don't save anyone. Uh, don't get that mixed up. Jesus is the Savior. But if we call him Lord, that means we now have the Spirit of the living God on the inside of us. We now have become ambassadors of Christ. As the Apostle Paul called, we become ambassadors of Christ, meaning that we represent Jesus to the world around us. And the Bible says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. It's as if God is calling out from within us, be reconciled to God. That's an amazing privilege and opportunity. So to sum it up, if we've been saved by the grace of Jesus, we now get the privilege of co-laboring with him and we get the opportunity to reach out to a lost and a dying 
world. But of course the question becomes, how do we do that? How do we do that effectively? Well, I'm glad you asked. I've got three simple things that we can personally do. Three simple ways that we can personally partner with Jesus in his mission of rescuing the lost. Here's, here's the first thought. We can share our personal story. We each have a story. Think back to where you were, what you were doing, when the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus rescued you. Think back, think long, think hard about what Jesus has done in, in your life. Each of us have a personal story of what he has rescued us out of. I think about the psalmist he wrote, I was in the miry clay. I was stuck, no direction, no way to get out, but he came, he rescued me, took me out of the miry clay and he set my feet on a rock. You and I, we each have a story. And listen, we have a responsibility to share that story. Never forget what Jesus has rescued us out of. And, and listen, you don't have to have it perfectly memorized. You don't have to understand the theology of it all. No, you just need to be willing to share your story. There's a story in one of the Gospels uh, about a man that was blind that Jesus healed. And, and, and I love it. Jesus heals him. And then the, the Pharisees and the religious ones pull him into the synagogue and they question him. And why did he make you well? And how is it that you can see? And they asked him all these theological questions that he was supposed to respond to. But I love his response. He said, look, I don't know. All I know is this. I was blind, but now I see. Listen, you can argue theology, but you cannot argue testimony. That's what God has done in my life. I can't explain it. I don't know why. I just know this. I was blind. But now I can see. I have a personal story. You have a personal story. And we have this responsibility to share it. Another way that we can share our story, look, we, we can pray that God would put us in a position where we would have to share our faith. I promise you, you pray a prayer like that, God will answer it. He will answer it. I started praying that prayer recently, and um, God has answered it in many ways. Uh, I was sitting one time at a coffee shop, and I was sitting there reading a book, and a guy came and dropped his laptop on my desk or on my little table there, and he asked me to watch it while he would go and use the restroom. So I said, yeah, I'll, I'll watch it. He went and used the restroom, came back a couple minutes later, and instead of taking his laptop and his stuff and moving back to his table where he was supposed to be, um, he just sat down at my table, and he began to ask me, what kind of book are you reading? I go, well, it's the Bible. Oh, and he began to share his thoughts about the Bible and about God and how you know, he didn't believe in this and that and that. And I realized that God had actually placed me there on purpose and that because I had been praying, God put me in a position where I need to share my faith. There I was right then, I began to share my story. And I began to share my faith with this man. I'm telling you, if you begin to pray for God to put you in position or put you in a, in a space where you have to share your story, he will do that. And I know that that can be a little nerve wracking, right? Like, well, what if I say something wrong? Just you need to remember that the power is not in the messenger. The power's in the message. The power's in the message. And when you begin to speak highly of Jesus, the Holy Spirit begins to anoint those words and he begins to do a work on human hearts. The power is not in the messenger, it's not in you, it's not in me. The power is in the message, in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if we're gonna partner with Jesus, if his mission is gonna become our mission, number one, we need to remember we have to share our personal story. Here's the second way that we can personally partner in the mission of Jesus. We need to take personal, responsibility. Please understand, God has no plan B for the world. His plan of rescue and redemption, it involves you and it involves me. It involves his church. We are co-laborers with Christ. And listen, you don't have to do it all. I don't have to do it all. The truth is we can't do it all, but we do need to do something. We need to take personal responsibility, personal responsibility to reach my family. Personal responsibility to, to reach my, my co-workers. Personal responsibility to reach those that I have in my sphere of influence that I come in contact with on a regular basis. And again, I think sometimes we can get so fearful. I gotta say the right thing. I gotta do the right thing. Listen, here's something that, that a, a, a very wise preacher told me one time. He said, look, don't count the conversions. Count the conversations. Just do something. Stretch your faith. Say a word. Watch what the Holy Spirit might do. Again, you don't have to do it all. Even the Apostle Paul said, look, I, I, I planted the seed. I, I preached the gospel. And then Apollos, another guy, he came and he watered it. He preached the gospel. 
but it was God that brought the increase. We are co-laborers with Christ. Let's partner together and let's take personal responsibility for reaching those in our world. Here's another way we can take personal responsibility. Personal responsibility to pray for people's salvation. I know that you and I, each of us have names and we have faces of people in our world that need Jesus. People that we know are far from him. People that we know once followed him but are not following him now. We need to take personal responsibility to be on our knees and to be beseeching heaven, praying that God would use us, that God would put laborers, other laborers in, in their pathway. Pray that God would give those people visions and dreams of himself, of his kindness and his goodness, that he would bring them into the kingdom. We have a responsibility to pray for people. Listen, lost people aren't lost on purpose. Like nobody wakes up in the morning and goes, hey, today I'm going to be lost. No, the, the Bible tells us that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, that the wicked one has blinded the eyes of people from seeing where they are at spiritually. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can remove that blind. But the Holy Spirit is the only one that can bring revelation that they need a savior to their heart. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can do that. But we have a responsibility to be on our knees praying, asking that the Holy Spirit would remove the blinders, asking that the Holy Spirit would intervene in the lives of these loved ones, in the lives of friends, that they would come to the realization that they need a Savior. We need to pray that God put us in a position where we can share our faith, where we can make a difference, where we can help bring them into your kingdom. If we're going to personally partner with the mission of Jesus, we need to take personal responsibility. And then here's the third and the final way that we can personally partner with the purpose of Jesus. We need to commit to personal relationship. I mean, look at the, the story that we read. Jesus is called the friend of sinners. He's in personal relationship. He's sharing meals with people that are outcasts of society, people that were looked upon and degraded and called sinners. And, and, and something I even have to ask myself on a regular basis is, Harrison, are all of your friends Christians? Because if all of my friends are Christians, um, then I'm doing something wrong. Here's the other side of the coin. If none of my friends know that I'm a Christian, I'm also doing something wrong. We need to stand out in the world and we need to be in relationship with people that think and look and act differently than we do. Listen, the, 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 the life of Jesus is such a radical example of this. He did life with, he invited the lost to come and have dinner with him. We need to model that in our own life. Something Pastor B used to say to me, he said, Harrison, when's the last time you had dinner with a sinner. It's true. When's the last time we interacted with people that we know need a savior? I, I, I love the apostle Paul when he wrote to the Thessalonians. He said, look, I didn't just share the gospel with you. I actually shared my life with you. Now, obviously we don't share our life with someone um, at the expense of them pulling us into a life of sin, especially if we have uh, you know, a, a natural predilection or, or, or a natural bent toward a particular sin. We, we don't need to be putting ourselves in, in a place of danger where we could get pulled back into a lifestyle. We need to be wise with that, but we also need to commit to being a source of consistency in the lives of those that don't know Jesus. We need to be a consistent voice of encouragement. We need to be a consistent voice of faith. We need to be a consistent example of generosity, of kindness, and of hope. We need to be a consistent force in their life where they look at us and they go, man, there's just something different about you. You know, right now the whole world is, is in fear, but you seem to just have this, this peace. Why is that? There's something different about you. You're just so consistently like full of joy. You, you consistently forgive when you're offended. Like how can that be? I'll tell you what, the key to breakthrough in any area of life is consistency. And if we're gonna reach people, we need to be a consistent voice in their life. Consistency is the key to breakthrough. You know, I've used this illustration before, but I was thinking about it this morning. Um, I, I, I grew up playing sports through high school. I played high school basketball. Uh, I feel like to some level, uh, I, I'm a proficient enough athlete. And, and every now and then I still like to play basketball. Um, and, and there's some guys on staff that play basketball. And sometimes we get together and play. One of the other guys on staff that plays basketball is Pastor Kenneth. And he and I, he and I are about the same height uh, somehow, some way. I always end up having to be the one that has to guard him. 
Um, he's much stronger than I am. He's much quicker than I am. Uh, and he's better looking than me anyway, but that's another story altogether. But, but we end up playing basketball together and I'm always having to guard him. And one of the reasons I don't like guarding Pastor Kenneth is because he's a perpetual mover. In other words, consistently, he just is always moving. He never slows down. He never stops. He never takes a break. He's always, always, always moving. Now, for about three quarters, I can hang with him because I'm in pretty decent shape. And so I'll run around with him and stuff. For three quarters, I can stay you know, on par with him. But in the fourth quarter, his perpetual motion, his consistency of motion eventually breaks down my defense. I am so tired out, I can't stick with him anymore. And then he drops 20 points on me in the fourth quarter. But, but here's the point I'm trying to make. It's his consistency. It's that perpetual motion that eventually breaks down my defense. And listen, there are people in our world that have defense mechanisms when it comes to the gospel. They put up walls, but I'm telling you, it's consistency. It's perpetual of motion, perpetually being in prayer, consistently showing up in the word, consistently showing up in worship, consistently showing up in people's lives will eventually begin to break down people's walls and defenses to the point where they become open to the gospel message, where they begin to see, wow, there's something different about you. You're always so full of hope, always so full of joy. You're always so kind, you're always so generous. How is that? Why is that? To which we can respond, it's Jesus. And he's rescued me. And he can rescue you. If the mission and the purpose of Jesus is to bring people into right relationship with God, well then that needs to become our mission and our purpose as well. Come on church. We can do this. We've been put into the kingdom for such a time as this. We can make a difference. Our lives, they can count for something eternal. So let's endeavor together to bring a living Jesus to a dying world. We started this service gathering believing that Jesus would speak to us, that he would minister to us, and I am sure that he has done that for you as he has done that for me. Thanks so much for joining together, all of us together in prayer, in spirit. Remember, it counts, it may be different, but it counts. And what also counts is we're starting a new series this Wednesday. It's called Jesus in the Old Testament. You know, we read a lot of the New Testament and we forget that Jesus said, that Old Testament, it speaks all about me. The New Testament may give us principles of Jesus, but the Old Testament gives us pictures, and you know the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I would encourage you, if you want a fresh perspective on Jesus, join us these Wednesdays in August as we look at Jesus as he shows up and is portrayed in the Old Testament. And then again, for many of you, this is the time when you give. And the easiest way to give is if you text Cottonwood to 77977. Thank you again for your giving. Maybe after the service and you've taken communion and you've heard the word and you just need to make an expression of gratitude to the Lord. You need to tell him, thanks so much for meeting me during these moments of worship and the word. Text Cottonwood to 77977 and know that what you're doing is giving him an offering. You're giving him a praise offering to him and he will be blessed by that. Again, thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful day, have a wonderful week, and we will see you here next time. God bless you.